In this section, I'll introduce you to the concepts behind our primary return measures, discuss how we manage the risk associated with returns, adjust returns for inflation, and show you how to calculate returns based on real-world data. From this point forward in the class, we'll be using spreadsheets with real-world data, so there will often be a spreadsheet associated with each class. Now, when we talk about a return, what we mean is the profit on an investment scaled by the amount that you invested. Your profit comes in two forms. The first is income f during the investment period, like a dividend or rental income. The second form it comes in is from the capital gains on the security. The capital gain on a security is just the increase in the value of the security. A capital loss indicates the value of the security decreased. The sum of your income and capital gains scaled by the amount you invested is your holding period return, or total return. Here I have the primary return formulas. You should already have these formulas committed to memory, but if you don't, make sure you do this now. These are arguably the second and third most important formulas in the field of finance behind the time value of money formula. You undoubtedly use these in your intro finance class, but we'll be using these almost every day in our class going forward. Our basic return formula is simply the price at the end of the period minus the price at the beginning, all divided by the price at the beginning. We often use this formula when we don't have any income during the investment period. If we have earned some income in the form of a dividend or rental income, we need to factor that into our return on investment. That's why we have the holding period return formula. The only difference here is that we include the dividend or income in the numerator. Let's try a few examples using these formulas. Let's say we have a one year zero coupon municipal bond and it's currently trading at $80. It's going to mature at its face value of $100. What is the annual return on this bond? Well, using the return formula that we have here, we can answer that pretty easily. Essentially, we have our price at the beginning, which is 80, and that's gonna be this P I, P sub I zero, and our $100 is the price at the end of the period, so P sub I one, and we'll just plug those in. So we have 100 minus 80 divided by 80, and our return is 25%. All right, let's try an example of holding period returns. So in this example, you purchased a share of Tesla stock for $150 exactly one year ago. The share paid a $1.50 dividend today, and you decided to sell the stock today for $205. What was your holding period return on the purchase of this stock? Well, here's our holding period return formula, pretty straightforward. And all we have to do is just plug in the information. We know that at the beginning of the period, we bought a share of Tesla stock for 150, so this is where that goes. And then we have our Tesla stock, which we're selling for 205, and we plug that in where it says P sub I comma one. Our dollar and 50 cent dividend just goes at the back of the numerator, and then we just use the holding period return formula, and we find that we have a holding period return of 37.67%. Now, while we have those two primary formulas, there are many other return formulas we use in finance. We'll discuss all of these formulas at some point, but they're all built on the basic return or holding period return formula. Now, let's talk about the historical returns around the world, since you should have some basic knowledge of historical returns to compare with the returns we'll be discussing in class. I've collected some data from BlackRock on the long-term annual returns of various securities in various countries. Notice that for each of these countries, stocks outperform long-term bonds, which outperform short-term bonds. All of these assets have historical average returns from 1900 until 2014 that are higher than annual inflation, meaning that over the long run, they're all profitable investments. We've already discussed the fact that investors demand higher returns when they're investing in riskier securities. Stocks outperform bonds because stock prices are more volatile than bond prices, and investors demand a higher return before they're willing to invest in those volatile stocks. Long-term bonds outperform short-term bonds because the probability of default between now and maturity is higher for bonds that have a longer time to maturity. Now, let's talk about nominal versus real returns. A nominal return is the return that gets reported. Almost every return you've ever heard reported is a nominal return. 
The nominal return is the return the investment earns expressed in current dollars. It doesn't account for the effects of inflation. A real return is the return adjusted for the change in total purchasing power. A real return is a nominal return adjusted for inflation. As you're hopefully aware from your macro courses, inflation measures the relative purchasing power of a dollar. If you could purchase a burger for a dollar yesterday, but you have to spend a dollar fifty today to purchase the same burger, your purchasing power decreased. This is why we care about real returns. We measure inflation using the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. The CPI is tracked and reported by the Federal Reserve on their FRED website. It tracks the cost to purchase the same basket of goods over time. If the cost of the basket of goods rises, this means that the dollar is depreciating and inflation is rising. Let's take a look. So here we have the Consumer Price Index on the FRED database, and as you can see, it's steadily increasing with a couple of decreases here and there. So right now, as of June 2020, the Consumer Price Index sits at 257.214. Really, the level doesn't mean a whole lot. What we're more interested in is how that level compares to, say, the level in a previous year. Everything is relative with the CPI. So here, as we can see, our current CPI is a lot higher than it was historically. What that indicates is that inflation is positive through time, or it's historically positive, although there are periods like in recessionary times, like in the 2008 financial crisis, where there was some deflation in the U.S. economy, as you can see here. Now, we measure inflation using the return formula and the value of the consumer price index. So basically, to measure inflation, what we're going to do is take the CPI at the end of the period minus the CPI at the beginning of the period, all divided by the CPI at the beginning of the period. And that's going to give us our change in the consumer price index or our inflation measure. Now let's talk about how to account for inflation. The primary way we adjust for inflation is by using the Fisher equation. And that's this thing right here. The Fisher equation is named after a famous economist named Irving Fisher, and it essentially says that one plus the real return on a security is equal to the quantity of one plus the nominal return divided by one plus the inflation rate over the same period. So all we need to do to calculate the real return is just take this one over to the other side and solve for the real return, and we'll have it. So let's take a look at how big of an impact inflation has on the purchasing power of investors historically. So there's a very often quoted statistic that the historical market return over the last 80 years has been about 8%. The average inflation over a similar period of time is about 3.3%. What I've done here is I've taken the nominal rate or the nominal value of $1 if you invested it for 40 years. And as you can see, if you're just investing it for 40 years and you're earning a nominal rate of return of 8%, you can see that that dollar appreciates to something like $23, or that's probably closer to $22. However, after we account for inflation using the Fisher equation, that $1 only appreciates to about $6. So in other words, inflation makes a massive difference. Now, just to show you exactly how big of a difference inflation makes, let's say we increase our inflation rate from 3.3% to, oh, let's say 15%, which is certainly possible and absolutely has occurred in the past. So as you can see here, in this case, when our inflation rate is 15% and our nominal rate is still 8%, you notice that our real value of our dollar depreciated. It went from a dollar to something less than a dollar. Zoom this out just so you can see it. Okay, so it's somewhere less than a dollar. The actual value of that dollar at the end of the 40 years is 8 cents. So inflation can dramatically decrease the real value of an asset or some currency over time. Now let's 
walk through a real world example. So the yield on the Turkish government bonds at the time I pulled this information was 12.5%. The inflation rate in the country of Turkey is 9.54%. What is the real rate of return a Turkish investor would earn on an investment in Turkish bonds? And round your answer to the closest basis point, uh, aka the closest hundredth of a percent. Well, we start off with the Fisher equation. Remember, that's just 1 plus the real rate of return is equal to 1 plus the nominal rate of return divided by 1 plus the inflation rate. And here, we know that the yield on government bonds is 12.5%. Because it doesn't explicitly state that this is adjusted for inflation, that means this 12.5% is our nominal return. The inflation rate is pretty straightforward here. It's just 9.54%. So we just plug in that information and solve for the real rate of return. And that'll give us a real rate of return of 2.7022%, which is a little smaller than this 12.5% rate of return initially stated in the problem. All right, let's try another question where we get from a nominal rate to a real rate. So the return on the market over the last five years over the last year was 14%. Over that same time period, the CPI increased from 200 to 210. What was the real return on the market after we control for inflation? Well, we already know that the nominal interest rate was 14%. And we know that we need to use the Fisher equation here to solve for the actual real rate. But to get our inflation factor, what we're gonna do is we're going to take the change in the CPI over the past year from 200 to 210. And we're looking for the percentage change in the, the CPI. And to get that, I mean, that, that equation is literally just the return formula. We just take 210 minus 200, all divided by 200, and that gives us a 5% inflation rate, which we just plug into the Fisher equation. And that'll give us a real return of 8.57%. Now, let's take a look at the difference between the APR, or annual percentage rate, and the effective annual rate, or EAR. The APR is a simple interest rate that doesn't take into account the benefits of compound interest. We calculate the APR by multiplying the periodic interest rate by the number of compounding periods, M. The number of compounding periods is 1 for annual compounding, 12 for monthly compounding because there's 12 months in a year, and 365 for daily compounding because obviously there's 365 days in a year. The EAR is the real rate of interest, which accounts for compound interest. We calculate the EAR by taking the quantity of 1 plus the periodic rate to the power of m minus 1. We can calculate the EAR using the APR and vice versa. So let's go ahead and take a look at this using a problem. So in this example, you own an asset which has a one basis point daily interest rate. And we're going to assume daily compounding. What are the APR and EAR? Well, our APR is calculated by taking your periodic interest rate, in this case, one basis point, or one hundredth of one percent, multiplied by the number of compounding periods per year. In this case, that'd be 365. So our APR for this question is 3.65%. Our EAR is calculated using this formula. So one plus our periodic interest rate, which is going to be one basis point to the power of the number of compounding periods, minus one. And that'll give us this. And total, that'll give us 3.72%. Now, obviously, there's a difference between our APR and EAR. That seven basis point difference from 3.72 minus 3.65, that's the benefit of compound interest. Now, it might seem small in this question, but let's take a look at what happens over a longer period of time. So here's a quick example I drew up. So in this case, we have a periodic monthly interest rate of 1%. Our initial value of our investment is $1,000, and we have 12 compounding periods per year since this is compounding monthly. And in this case, uh, our APR is 12%, and our EAR is 12.68%. Over a period of 30 years, 
you can see a clear difference between the value of this investment using the EAR versus the APR. Obviously, compound interest does matter. I mean, this entire area between the blue line and the red line, that's the benefit, the additional benefit of compound interest. It's interest on interest. So, there you go. Now let's talk about arithmetic versus geometric averages, both of which are used in investments. An arithmetic average is the thing you learned in probably third grade. It's just the sum of all values divided by the number of values. In finance, we often want to calculate the arithmetic average return. The formula for the arithmetic return on stock A is listed in this equation. So it's just the sum of all of our returns at each point in time divided by the number of returns. The geometric average is a little more complicated. It calculates the average return you would need in each period in order to start with a certain amount and end with the amount that you have at the end of the time period. In other words, if you started with $1,000 in your brokerage account and ended five years later with $2,000, the return over that period that would get you from $1,000 to $2,000 is your geometric average return. In case you're wondering, that geometric average return would be about 14.87%. The geometric average return weights returns in later periods more heavily than it does for earlier periods. To get the geometric average return, what we're going to do is take the product, that's what this symbol means, of one plus each return at each point in time, all to the power of one divided by n, where n is the total number of periods, and then we're going to subtract one, and we subtract one to get rid of the principal. All right, let's go through an example. So I have the example on this slide, but I'm gonna move over to Excel and show you how to solve this thing. So we have Netflix stock price and dividend history in this example, obviously this is a fictitious example. Uh, so price at the start of 2002 is $100 per share, pays a $4 dividend every year, and the price fluctuates over time. Calculate the arithmetic and geometric average holding period returns over this four year period. So I'm gonna move over to Excel and we'll see how this works. All right, so here's that same problem from a few seconds ago. First off, let's get the arithmetic average return. So first things first, we need to calculate the return for each year. And to do that, I'm just going to take the price at the end minus the price at the beginning plus the dividend, since this is, this is a holding period return. And we're going to divide by the price at the beginning. So there we go. Uh, if you want to speed this process up, you can copy this formula all the way down to the bottom by double clicking down here by the bottom right corner of the cell. And it'll just fill in the same formula all the way down. All right, that's that. Let's calculate the arithmetic average return. And we get an average holding period return of 4.21%. Next, let's get the geometric average return. All right, so remember, the geometric average return is this thing. We need the product of one plus each of those holding period returns that we just calculated, and then we're going to take that to the power of one divided by n. And in this problem, we have four years, so n will be four. And then we're going to subtract one to get rid of the principal that we added. All right, so we have our returns here. And we're just going to add one to each of them. And now we're going to calculate our geometric average return. And we're going to take that to the power of 1 divided by the number of years worth of returns we have, subtract 1, and that'll get us our geometric average return of 3.57%. All right, now, there's an easier way to do this than just using this massive formula. 
The reason I had us calculate all these one plus returns is because there's actually something called the GeoMean formula that can speed this process up tremendously. So let's use it. So I'm going to take equals GeoMean. And the GeoMean essentially calculates the geometric mean of whatever numbers that you put into it. So here I'm going to ask it to take the geometric mean return of these four returns. So it's essentially going to do everything that happened in this early part, this first half of our equation, where we took the product of these four values, took it to the power of one fourth. The problem with the GeoMean formula is that you still need to subtract one at the very end because you added in one to each of these returns. So once I do that and then and then change this to a percentage and scale this out, what you can see is that we get the same value. So either way you want to calculate the geometric average return is fine. You just need to know how to do it. Now let's discuss the internal rate of return or IRR. The IRR is the discount rate that equates an investment's cost to the present value of the benefits that it provides for the investor. We can calculate it using both Excel and the BA2 calculator. On Excel, we'll use the IRR function, this thing right here. We also use the IRR button on the BA2 calculator. All right, so let's take a look at an example. So in this example, we have two stocks and we make an investment of $1,000 right now and receive these cash flow streams. Let's calculate the IRR for each of these securities. Let's do this first in Excel. So I'm just on the IRR tab. All right, IRR function, very simple. We'll just do equals IRR and highlight all of the values that are going into that rate of return and Excel will solve for the internal rate of return that, that makes the NPV equation where NPV equals zero and all these cash flows on the right hand side balance. Now we'll do the same thing for our second stock. So equals IRR, highlight all of our values. And we find that stock A actually offers a higher rate of return than stock B. So in this case, if we're picking between stocks and all else is held equal, we would want to invest in stock A. Now let's see how we do this on the BA2 calculator. This should be a fairly basic review for you since you did have Finance 300, but let's just go through it. So on the BA2 calculator, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the cash flows function and we're going to enter in all of our cash flows. So CF0 is our cash flow at time period 0, so 1000 and enter the negative sign and lock that in by pressing enter. Next, we want to go down and we're going to receive cash flows of $30 for the next 4 years. So I'm going to enter in 30 to indicate cash flow 1 press enter and we're receiving it for four years. So F01 is just the frequency of cash flow one. That'll be four. And then finally, our cash flow two here will be 1250. Lock that in and then make sure that frequency of cash flow two is one. Now you're ready to solve for the IRR. So go over to the IRR button here and just hit compute and you'll find that the IRR of stock A is the same as what we found over here in Excel, 6.84. This is in percentage terms. All right, let's go ahead and recap since I've done a lot. There are many formulas for returns in investments. We covered just the basic returns, holding period returns, APR, EAR, IRR. I mean, there's, there's just a ton of them out there. You need to know how to calculate each of those. Hopefully this was more of a review since you've had an intro in fi intro to finance class. We will use a number of these throughout the class, but usually as a part of something else that we're doing. Next, remember that the real return is adjusted for inflation. The nominal return 
is the return that's qu quoted to us. So almost every return that you hear about in the real world is a nominal return, and it's not being adjusted for the depreciation of the currency over the time period through which you're investing. Next, we talked about the geometric and arithmetic average returns. The geometric average return is the average periodic return that gets you from a starting point to an end point, a present value to a future value of your investment. The arithmetic average is just the average, it's just you take the return at each period in time, divide by the number of periods that you have, and that's your arithmetic average return. We're going to use both of those going forward as well. So with that being said, I am going to wrap up, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, and I'll see you on the next video.